So anyway, welcome everybody. And uh, this is an Ajahn Brahm retreat. When I will do the meditation at the, the end of this uh, session. Uh, when I ever teach Buddhism, I often um, emphasize the importance of the meditation simply because that's the way I started to learning how powerful meditation can be and how it serves the purpose of cleaning the mind from what the Buddha called the five hindrances. And this is things which distort your perception and may make you see things which aren't really there, which aren't really true. Basically, you see what you want to see and you're in denial for things which challenge you. And also that the meditation uh, creates this wonderful sense of peace and happiness and good health, which is an amazing thing to see and to experience, especially the happiness. People like joy. And I do recall when I decided to become a monk, that many people said that I wouldn't last as a monk. And this is 48 years later, after all day as a monk, I can say that you were wrong, all you people who thought I wouldn't last. When I asked them, why did you think I wouldn't last as a monk? They said, because you were too happy. And there's something about uh, spirituality. They always think that there's no pain, there's no gain without pain. And to me, that doesn't make sense at all. Why would a person join even this retreat if it was going to be painful and unpleasant? And because of that, that when I heard people go to some of these retreats, and when they would say that they were thought they had to do this retreat, but it was very painful and torturous. To me, that told me that that was not a good retreat, or they misunderstood its purpose. So these days, wherever I give a retreat, you know, I usually nickname it Club Med Meditation. So this is Club Med Oxford at the moment. This is where we're holding this retreat. This is where I'm speaking from. So Club Med gives people the idea that this is beneficial, pleasant, and happy, which is one of the reasons why the schedule over here gives you a lot of free time. There's not free time to think, okay, I'm not online now. I can watch the TV and check out, you know, who won the cricket match. Instead of that, you know, we make use of the space you know, between the sessions, either to rest or to meditate some more. And if you want to know which one to do, just ask your body, ask your mind. This is something which I say many times and find very effective. I do it myself. Sometimes I have a bit of free time. And I ask my body, body, what do you want to do? It's not what I want to do, but I'm sensitive, mindful, aware of my body. And I know my body. I've known my body for 71 years. And so when I ask that question, I can pretty much understand what my body needs. Even with the posture, when I meditate, I ask my body, body, how do you feel? Do you want to be moved? Do you want to put your legs out? Do you want to uh, straighten up your back? And my body is very, very smart. It tells me what to do. And because I look after it, then it looks after me. And also I ask my mind, mind, what do you want to do? And when I listen to my mind, sometimes my mind says, oh, I just want to be peaceful. I don't want to watch the breath. I don't want to I scan the body, I just want to be peaceful, okay. And I listen to my mind and I work as a friend to my mind. When I work as a friend towards my mind, it's like my mind and me are best friends, which means that 
I have very little difficulty with a wandering mind. My mind never wants to wander away. Because when we meditate, and it's like chilling out with your best friend. When you're chilling out with your best friend, someone you're not afraid of, or someone you like, of course you hang out together. And that restlessness disappears. It's quite simple. You don't need to think a lot because thinking, again, is an expression of restlessness. You just hang out together with your mind in peace and stillness. So this is actually what happens on these types of retreats. And you also know that over those years, I have developed uh, a vocabulary, different words to try and help uh, understand just how powerful these concepts are. And of course, the main word is the kindfulness. Adding kindness to mindfulness. So when you're aware of your body, you're not just watching it, you're actually watching it with compassion. And it's amazing just how people can be compassionate to their cat or their dog, or compassionate to people they love. They don't know how to be compassionate to this old body which you've been living in for such a long time, or to this mind you have to live with. Being kind to it means you know, allowing it to be. Sometimes my mind has really lots of energy. Sometimes my mind is tired. So what do I do? When my mind has lots of energy, you know, you can serve and do stuff. When it's tired, Sometimes it needs us to go to bed. This is weird, but I've been practicing this for many years now, that often, if I have an hour or two, which is a free time, I'd ask my mind, mind, what do you want to do? I never say what it should do. I say, what do you want to do? What do you need, mind? And of course, because I've been aware, mindful, and now I'm kindful, in my mind, I know exactly what it needs. But a few times my mind has said to me back, take me to bed, have a rest. It's one of the reasons the advantage, advantages of a Zoom retreat, you can go to bed at any time. And if that's what your mind says you need, go and take a break and a rest. And afterwards, you feel so much better, quite a few times. The reasons I can't ever understand, my mind said, go and take a rest. It was clear. I wasn't indulging in, in laziness. When I went and lay down, I knew it wasn't laziness, because as soon as my head hit the pillow, that you were gone. I had a very nice sleep for half an hour, 45 minutes. And then when I woke up afterwards, he felt so much energy. It was like my mind was saying to me, thank you. Thank you for being sensitive to me. Or well, the body was doing the same. Thank you for listening to all these signals. And because that I'd listened to those signals and rested, afterwards it felt really lots and lots of good energy. So during this retreat, you, know, you don't need to have uh, seven days of meditating five or six hours every day, if that works, fine. But you know in meditation, just one deep good meditation is better than 60 or 70 hours of uh, tense meditation. So remember to look for those beautiful good meditations where you can break through and see things and experience things you've never seen before. So listen to your body and listen to your mind. It's also why there's lots of free time for you. So you can adjust your schedule, adjust the times that you eat, adjust everything so that your body and mind can feel free. Whenever we talk of noble silence, I always remember talking, uh, the first time I introduced noble silence, the noble silence doesn't mean no speaking. Noble silence means on a retreat, no bells. So on my retreats, 
we never have a bell. Okay, now that's a gong, but this is a bell. In other words, I often just fantasize about what would happen if the Buddha was under the, the, the Bodhi tree. And under the Bodhi tree that suddenly, you can, hello. Under the Bodhi tree, he was about to enter the jhanas and then suddenly, <laughs> someone rang a gong. And there would be no Buddha anymore. It would disturb his, his meditation, disturb his retreat. And I don't know why actually people have bells and gongs on a meditation retreat. It's like being at school again. And you get put in detention if you're, you're late for the lesson. No, Buddhism is not like that. It's kind. Bells are there to control people's attendance. And I don't like any control at all. I like to trust my own mind and my own body and trust each one of you. So you meditate as long as you feel it's being helpful for you. And no bells on a retreat means the first few days, many people, is, oh, these are my retreats where uh, we're face to face. Many of those uh, retreats where we don't have any bells, people don't have to get up at a certain time in the morning, they don't have to go to bed at a certain time. People's meditation gets more deep and more powerful simply because they don't have this like bell, like a sword of Damocles hanging over them. Oh, I've got to get to the talk. Oh, I've got to get to the meditation session. Oh, I better go to bed early so I can wake up early to go to the early morning meditation. That type of stress is taken away from you. You're kind to your body and mind. Some days your body needs more sleep. Sometimes it hardly needs any sleep at all. That's my experience. And so the times when it needs a bit more sleep, okay, go to bed, sleep in. There are times when it's really full energy, oh great, I don't have to listen to that bell, I have to go to sleep at a certain time. In other words, your meditation becomes far more sensitive, far more aware to what your body and mind needs. And that compassion and kindness leads to far deeper meditations. Very often on these retreats, when we start, many people's requirement for a bit of extra sleep is very strong. So the first few days, if you need to sleep, please indulge your body. Make sure you get enough sleep. Because in today's world, people do suffer from sleep deficit. For one reason or another, maybe because they're organizing this retreat, or because they you know, have many difficulties with their body, sometimes you need more sleep. That's not indulgence, that's kindness towards your body. And you find there's so many stories of people, when I gave a nine day retreat, you hardly saw them because they were sleeping a lot at the beginning, they were catching up. And after they caught up with their sleep deficit, then afterwards, their meditation took off. They got some fantastic deep meditations. Because in those times that they were sleeping and resting, they were actually practicing the kindfulness of being aware of their body, being kind to it, and allowing it to heal. Uh, just last night at the London Buddhist, uh, the Buddhist Society in London, Eccleston Square, I was talking about how to heal the body. And how to heal the body began with being aware of your body, being sensitive to it, being mindful. It's just not, it's not just being mindful and doing nothing. Oh yeah, I'm tired. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm hurting. It's more than that. And if you find there is a problem, then try and do something to heal it. And then it's the same with the tiredness. Do something to heal that tiredness. 
and a lot of times when there's meditation retreats, people don't just talk about restlessness, they also talk about the um, tiredness which they have. And please never push through that tiredness. You lose all the time. If you're tired, we have things called beds. You know what beds are for? What you use beds for? They're sleeping. Take a rest. Be kind to your body. And people think, oh, Ajahn Brahm is just too soft. He should be more strict. He should go to everybody's room in the morning at three o'clock and wake them up. Or we should have, oh, we don't need to do that. We can have like speakers in everybody's room. Then at four o'clock, four o'clock, wake up everybody. Get up, you lazy, good for nothings. That type of thing, that's just controlling. That's not the way of meditation, which trusts people. And in my years as a meditator, as a teacher, I trust people. And when you trust people, they nearly always really come good. If they breach that trust, they feel terrible. And then I, of course, forgive them. You know my saying, how many times sh should you forgive someone? And the answer is always one more time. And that's a beautiful teaching because it trusts them to do a bit, of ne a bit better next time. And then you actually, you are overcoming your spouse and torpor. You're overcoming your restlessness. Two of the biggest problems in meditation. And then because you're kind to your body and kind to the mind, that kindness creates the trust that you have with your own mind. In other words, when you close your eyes and start to meditate, oh, your mind is with you. And your mind loves to be still. You may think this is weird. You haven't experienced much stillness. This is the natural state of your mind, is to be still. So much so that even the Buddha mentioned the simile of the tree or the leaves on the tree or the leaves on the bush in the forest. Those leaves only move because a wind is blowing. If the wind stopped, the leaves will be still. If that's their, their nature, their default state. And in this art of disappearing, once things become still, they turn off, they disappear. Just like your computer screen. You don't press anything. The computer screen goes in its screensaver mode. And after a while, the screensaver mode turns off and your computer goes blank. Just like everything in this world, if it is still, it disappears. That's why we call this the art of disappearing. So during this retreat, I give many examples of how to be still in your body and in your mind comfortably still. You sit there, you're not holding the body still. You're kindly letting the body be still. And after a while, there's hardly any movement there at all. And then you go to your mind, and then the mind becomes still. And it becomes beautiful. I'm not just saying Ajahn Brahm's mind. This is cause and effect, this is nature. Once the mind has some stillness, it becomes, this mindfulness increases in power. And then you can go out for a walk and whatever you see, whatever you hear, whatever you taste is uh, enhanced. Just one little simile on a retreat which I did uh, many years ago, after the retreat was finished, I had my breakfast, the first breakfast, 
and during that breakfast, I just there was a baked bean. Baked beans were given for breakfast. I had baked beans this morning, and when I put, I just put one baked bean, just one, a single one, on a spoon and put it in my mouth. And I'm not exaggerating. That was amazing. It was a taste sensation. I didn't know who would cook that baked bean. Was it one of these celebrity chefs who just made it just the most delicious single baked bean I've ever eaten in my life? And I asked you know, the cooks in my monastery, who cooked that? Oh, just out of the tin, a tin of baked beans. Mr. Hines or somebody cooked that baked beans. <laughs> but because my mindfulness had increased enormously, that baked bean tasted so amazing. So this is actually what happens. But during the meditation, if you follow it, you do get rewards. You don't meditate to achieve rewards, rewards, so but those rewards come naturally. The one to look out for is the joy of meditation, the increase in your mindfulness. The awareness becomes superpower awareness. You know that because when you have a cup of tea or coffee, whatever you take, you just start sipping it. It's the most delicious tea you've ever drunk in your life. And you have the time to enjoy every part of it. You go out into the garden, you watch the sunset. And that sunset is not just beautiful, it's magnificent. And this is like the feedback, and it's supposed to happen. Don't be afraid of it. Indulge in it. Have fun with it. And this is you know, what I hope for you in your meditation. That also gives you the power of good health, a happy mind. It's almost like free happiness in this world, which once you know how to turn it on, wow. Why didn't anyone tell me about that before? Now I'm telling you. It's there for you. So anyway, as usual, I speak too much. So now I want to introduce a guided meditation. Just not only for, for half an hour, is that correct? A five minutes break if people want a five minute break. So if you need a five minute break, off you go. And if you don't need a five minute break, Take a four minute break. If you can't do four minute break, three minute, not three minute, try a two minute one. If not one minute, one minute. If you don't want any break at all, here's Ajahn Brahm's latest terrible joke. <laughs> it's all recorded, so you can get this terrible joke later on. And I ask people, how many letters? Actually, first of all, I got this joke from a six-year-old Vietnamese kid. Could have been seven, but he's not that old. And he came up to me and asked me, Ajahn Brahm, how many letters are there in the English alphabet? And I said, 26. 26. And he said he could only remember 25. I asked him why. And he said, I've forgotten why. That's why I could only remember 25. Amina likes it. Sorry? Amina likes it. Yeah, okay. I haven't changed Amina. Just had to have one stupid jokes. But it wasn't mine. It was a six or seven year old kid, Vietnamese. I don't know if there's any Australians on this retreat other than me. But anyway. You're not an Australian. I am, I'm dual nationality. Mm. And anyway, this Australian. This was actually, again, a Vietnamese joke, and I really appreciated this. This is just when other people go to the toilet, so I'm just telling jokes. This um, Vietnamese kid, he went to school, and at school his uh, teacher told him about IQ. So he went home and asked his daddy, Daddy, what does IQ mean? His daddy replied, IQ is a measure of your intelligence, how clever you are. If you have an IQ of 120, you're very smart. IQ of 140, then you probably go to university. 
most people, the average is uh, IQ is of 100. If you only got IQ of 80, you know, have a difficulty, you know, getting a good job in life. And if your IQ is only 60, you'd be so stupid, you won't be able to tie up your own shoelaces. And the Vietnamese boy replied, oh, is that why most Australians wear thongs? <laughs> oh, thongs mean sandals. <laughs> without, without laces. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've got Annie, Anna here, who's uh, laughing her head off. <laughs> it's a good joke. Anyway, okay, I think most people are back now, so they don't have to in, endure another terrible joke. Now, one of the reasons I tell jokes, especially on retreats, is so people can relax. They feel more at ease. Besides, a few people haven't come back yet, so this was honest. I, I was a school teacher for one year, and that was in a school in Devon, King's School, Ottery St. Mary. And I was teaching maths and physics, and I got permission from the principal at the time of actually putting a joke in the exam paper. And the kids, <laughs> it, was, it was a wonderful idea. Because once, you know, in, if you remember when you were a kid, you went into these examination rooms. I think it was like there was three O levels, the year before O levels. And the kids went into the examination room. Everyone had to be quiet. And I had to be the invigilator, you know, the teacher sitting on the desk, making sure everybody uh, behaved. And the kids knew I was their maths teacher. So I said, now sit down quietly, and when I tell you, you can turn the exam papers over, and you have an hour and a half to complete the paper. And so first thing to do, read it all first of all. And that's what they did, very quietly. You can see in these poor school children's, maybe for a 14-year-old or 15-year-old, they were terrified of the exam, and people thought it was so important. It was important, but not that important. So they were looking through the exam paper, reading it. And then they came to my joke. And I saw them, like, stunned. There's a joke in the exam paper. And many of them, they looked up at me and their teacher, the school teacher, and I had this big you know, what became an Ajahn Brahm smile, big smile on my face. <laughs> and they smiled back and giggled a little bit, and they relaxed. And so they did very well on their examination paper. That idea of relaxing a person before they actually do the task is very, very powerful. And even today here, we're in Oxford, walking down to the Thames. You saw it just in the distance, you know, a few of those student boats you know, rowing on the river. And I remember when I was an oarsman at Cambridge, I wasn't sort of uh, in the boat races or anything, the big league. But nevertheless, I did uh, row these big boats, these eights. And I remember just the coach who was cycling on the towpath shouted out at me, my lay name then was Peter. Peter, you're making an ugly face. It was hard work. And he said, smile. And I did. And I found out that once I smiled, I had more energy. And putting that oil was more easy. I learned from that. If you smile before you meditate, the meditation is easier. And you go deeper. <laughs> okay, so now let's start. So it's only half an hour meditation. Is that right? Half an hour? It's 5.30 now? Okay, so here we go. So please close your eyes. If you fall asleep, that's fine. As long as I don't fall asleep. 
So I've got a little child who's sitting next to me. If I fall asleep, just throw something at me. I'll be asleep. <laughs> You'll be asleep. Don't snore. <laughs> so anyway, you close your eyes. Bring your awareness always to your body, first of all. And I make sure I look after my body. I'm kind to it. Body, sometimes I have to push you. But in meditation, I respect you. You're my friend. So I ask my body, body, how can I make you more comfortable? And you find out if it's stretching your legs or if it's just uh, moving your back this way or that way. Remember, for the next half an hour, you have to be with your body. But be kind to it at the beginning. And I'm still aware of my body as well as speaking to you. And I find out my legs, well, they're pretty, pretty good. My butt is comfortable enough. And my back, you know, this is where I, I always make sure my back is comfy. Otherwise, you may be comfortable at the beginning, but it gets painful as you go on. You're not being kind to your back. So learn from your back, from the feedback which mindfulness gives you. Be kind to your back. So I'm wiggling it about, if you can see me. Now my body, my back especially, feels really good. And I go to the front of my body. I like doing this because I'm getting old. Oh, sorry, I'm not getting old. I'm already old. I have to look after my health. So I just do a scan through my intestines and my stomach and lungs my heart and all those other organs that are on my back. I scan them today very quickly. And if I find any place which doesn't feel relaxed and at ease, I stop there. I don't know why, but my stomach feels a little bit uneven. It's weird, these words. What do they mean? This means that there's, there's some attention required there. I think I know why I had a cup of tea. still actually with me. should have drunk it when it was first brewed, but it's a bit sort of acidy now. I drank some of it, probably the cause. So anyway, I can feel that little tightness there. With mindfulness, you give a kindness, and the mindfulness tells you that if it gets less, less kind of stretch, it gets less of a problem. Mindfulness is there to give you that feedback. Kindness is there to relax and heal things open things up so healing can happen. And my my tummy feels at ease now. I move it my mindfulness right up my body down to my shoulders. Relax my shoulders down my arms to my fingertips. Find anything on the way which needs adjusting I will adjust it. back up to my shoulders and my neck, I do find that it's important to make sure your head is well balanced on top of the neck. Then you don't get neck pain or stomach pain. I'm not stomach, I mean back pain. Position of the head on top of the neck. 
is important. So I make sure it's well balanced. Then I go to my face. You can feel sensations around the eyes, and the mouth, around the cheeks. And those sensations are often caused or related to the emotions I feel right now. That's why many people say you can read a person's emotional strength or emotional difficulties by looking at their face. So when you relax the muscles around the eyes and the mouth, around the nose, anywhere else on the forehead, how do you relax them? Mindfulness gives you the opportunity to try cause and effect. Usually we call it trial and error. You find out what works, what doesn't work. And after many years of meditating like that, you soon know how to relax your face easy. And it gives a nice segue into the mind, how to relax the mind. Before we go to that mind, when I sit like this, having relaxed the body, my body feels delightful. There's a pleasure in mindfulness and kindness and the relaxation it causes. It feels good. It's one of the reasons why people go for a a foot massage or a body massage or sit on a recliner on a nice warm sunny afternoon. The body relaxes and that has a certain pleasure associated with it. And I encourage you to be aware of that delight, that pleasure. Because it's related to the delight and pleasure you'll find later when you're watching your breath. It takes you deeper. The Buddha said it's not to be feared. Unfortunately for me anyway, that delight has come early. I feel my body relaxing to the max. It's delightful. And I know, I know from my own experience, it's time for me to move on to the mind. And the way I do that, I just ask myself straight away, how peaceful am I? Because peace is a measure of the quality of your mind. You don't feel peace in the body, you feel relaxation. Peace. Is a mental object. It's a great object to watch to start the mind part of meditation. Once you know your peace, watch that peace with kindness and find the peace gets stronger, deeper. You know it gets deeper when you come into the present moment as now. That becomes 
contentment with a new past or future. Just have me being here. In order to maintain that mind state of contentment, no need to watch anything. Don't have any goals. Then when you find those goals will come to you. We're now going to be quiet for the last 10 or 15 minutes. It's for you to enjoy this meditation.
and coming towards the end of the meditation session. Please keep your eyes closed. How was this meditation for you? How did it feel? How peaceful was it? Was that peace pleasant for you? Did you perceive the beauty, the delight of a peaceful mind? If you wanted something more, you cannot appreciate that peace. How does your body feel? Please be kind to your own body. Your body is always pleasant back to you. When you are ready, you may open your eyes. Thank you for your participation. Three minutes to six. So we have a break, I believe now. And after the break, we come back at half past seven. Only half up now. Half past seven, so yeah, half okay. past seven. Okay. So for you, if you can turn up at about 20 past, that would be very lovely. And um, yes, um, I see those on live stream too, I think. Are they also coming in the evening, Matthias? Yeah, we'll live stream the next session as well. Yeah, so, do you want to wave to the live stream, Ms. Ajahn? Hi. <laughs> 